What's up, guys, and welcome to another Hungover Podcast, episode 142. This is unfortunately yet another solo pod done by your boy, Julian, right here. That's right, I'm doing another Hungover Podcast by myself, but that's because Yvonne is still moving down to New Orleans. I got an update from him saying that he listened to my last podcast and he said it was good. Thanks for your words of encouragement, Yvonne. That's what keeps me going. That's what keeps me waking up in the morning, buddy. I appreciate it. Uh, No, of course, I really appreciate it. I appreciate anyone that um, takes the time out of their day to listen to our crazy podcast, even if they don't like it. (laughs) Uh, But anyways, today we're going to be getting into some uh, pretty cool topics, I would say. We're going to talk about Monster Hunter Rise, a video game that literally just came out yesterday as far as uh, I'm concerned, because I'm recording this on Saturday morning. This is my morning routine interrupted because I need to get this podcast out. I don't care what it takes. I don't care if I have to do these podcasts solo until the year is over, all right? Putting out a podcast every week this year, and that's my goal. So, anyways, we're going to be discussing Monster Hunter Rise because I just got that game. It's a really fun game. I'm going to give you a quick preview slash review of it. Maybe it can convince you to get the game. Who knows? I also would like to discuss the worldwide shortage of semiconductors and um, what it really means for... many many industries that use semiconductors uh, moving forward i'd also like to discuss the nintendo switch rumors i suppose we'll go monster Hunter rise nintendo switch pro rumors and uh, finally i would like to discuss the (laughs) more comical but of course uh detrimental delay on the suez canal where a um cargo ship got stuck it's more funny to me because i don't see how that could possibly happen but uh i also don't know how to drive a cargo ship so maybe it's pretty difficult it probably is anyways i guess we should move on keep it the podcast a rolling we're gonna discuss some things that i did this week because i'd like to tell you guys about it I think that's how we open up our podcast. It's just like a a real quick way to break the ice for us. For me, I've been working hard at the old butcher shop. It's Passover week, uh, and we operate on the Upper West Side where there are a lot of Jewish people. So I've been... uh, Our goal this week was to come in on Wednesday. Our, Our week essentially operates from Tuesday to Monday, um in terms of production so we get all our animals in on tuesdays and we butcher them throughout the week and we do um all the wrap up on monday we'll make sausage for instance uh, to get rid of a lot of trim and that type of thing Uh, so this week though we wanted to get all of our butchery done on wednesday so we were all hands on deck on wednesday it was pretty fun Uh, It was cool to see our team. We've just pretty much gotten me and the other apprentice, Jack, up to uh, up to speed in terms of uh, being able to do everything. I'm I'm a little further along in the apprenticeship program so I can break down lamb and do sausage. So I'm pretty much done. Um, But uh, Jack is still working on chucks. So it was cool to see everyone on the table. We had five people on this tiny ass butcher table. It was pretty impressive uh, that we were able to, you know, it's like, oh, pull a piece, throw it across. You clean this, pull a piece. It it, it was a lot of fun. Um, I don't know. That's that's the well-oiled machine that we can possibly be in the future. We'll see if I stay there, though, because they don't pay me that much. It's a fun job, but it's also really hard. So I, I don't know if I'll stay there too long. But 
I am having fun in the meantime. It would be nice to get the amount of money that I deserve, however, for my level of education, because <laughs> I have a PhD in chemistry. It's all right, though. I, I'm not. I I just like to make a little bit more money. I'm not. I'm not trying to become a rich person by any means, but it'd be nice to make a little bit more. In other news, uh, let's see. I bought a smoker, and I intend to use it on my weekend. So I bought a Gion Tex vertical charcoal grill smoker. So it's going to use. It's not electric, which I'm a big fan of. I don't want to plug in my outdoor grill, for Christ's sake. Um, I, I'm not a big fan of propane. I understand that propane is nice, um, that in that you can just go ahead and, uh, fire up the grill real fast. But I, I like the, if I'm going to be cooking outdoors, I want to, you know, I want to start the fire. I want to do all these things. Um, I want to get dirty. It's, it's a whole process. It's, it's a fun time to cook outdoors you want the smoke flavor i'm gonna try to get into i've been doing my research i bought my wood chips or my wood chunks rather that will burn longer and cleaner um, i'm going to smoke a three pound brisket and i oh mean come on guys i can't eat that much and my my girlfriend hardly eats as it is so it's like i gotta get something that is indicative of barbecue so i got a pork butt and a very nice piece of brisket i took it from all those passover people <laughs> that's not a thing that i should have said the people who celebrate passover the jewish people i took a little bit of brisket from them so i could have barbecue i don't want to do the jewish preparation of brisket which i as far as I know, is covered in ketchup and onions and let it go for hours. I mean, that sounds great. Don't get me wrong. I'm sure the ketchup caramelizes nicely and then the onions get all crispy in there. Probably pretty good. And then you got a soft brisket under. I'm trying to do barbecue of her. Gonna rub those bad boys up and try to tend to a fire all day. It'll be fun. I'll tell, uh, I intend to make a video about it. I already filmed part of it where i put the the uh, smoker together and all that stuff so there will be a review of this smoker it's a two compartment smoker so it's a vertical box essentially there's two doors one low door one door on the bottom half and one door on the top half the top half has a couple trays in there that you can put obviously the meat and then um there's also two uh bowls that you can place things in one is i believe as far as i know a water pan and two, the other one would obviously hold the charcoal and the 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 uh the wood chunks so that's going to be super fun i intend to uh have a beer in hand all day and just have a great old time on the outdoor deck hopefully i don't start a fire on my deck uh it should be fun that's what i intend to do and I also intend to play some Monster Hunter Rise this weekend. So let's go ahead and get into the topic of the show. One of the topics of the show, Monster Hunter Rise. So this game um, is considered the sixth main installment of the Monster Hunter franchise after coming after Monster Hunter World. So I, I originally played Monster Hunter World when it came out. I thought it was a great time. Uh, the graphics were cool. It was on PS4. I played online with a couple of buddies. Uh, it was a lot of fun. That game was cool. It, I I sort of got distracted and couldn't invest enough time into it. I spent about 40 or 50 hours, which I know is uh, laughable in the face of, of Monster Hunter pros who go out there and get every single gear for every single weapon, for every single armor set, you know? But essentially, what Monster Hunter boils down to is it's a, a very intricate um, monster combat game where you're you're tracking down these monsters. Um, and since Monster Hunter World, I believe they've made it a completely open map 
with no loading zones and there's uh also uh you know it's there's uh more streamlined ways of tracking these monsters uh i haven't quite noticed that in monster and rise yet for instance there would was whatever that bug was that just gave you a, a straight shot to the monster essentially it would trail the monster and that was that was super awesome uh and streamlined that's why i liked monster in world uh but it was it was also so essentially this this game's because it's made by capcom which again this is one of their most popular franchises by the way uh you can really see their sort of fighting game esque um combat in it that you really it really wants you to understand the combat system as opposed to just mashing buttons which a lot of action role-playing games can lead to um each weapon has a different fighting style each monster has different patterns that you need to learn to dodge and and work around and take advantage of there are different states in which the monsters can be in um they will run from you it's it's a whole thrill of the hunt type situation and once you really master that fight down uh, you become a, a pretty cool, a pretty well-oiled machine. That's what we like to say on this show, I guess. Uh, it's a Vaughn saying, even though it's not even his saying. But uh, it's it's you become this death ball of of awesome power, um, and it's it's really cool. It's all about. I'm describing Monster on as a whole right now. We'll get into Monster and Arise uh, as an individual game, but it you build up all your gear you end up uh harvesting things from the monsters once you defeat them to level up your gear and make it and make it look really cool too like the uh, designs of the gear are awesome uh because it's all inspired by the the monsters that you defeat which are also incredibly well designed they're super cool looking monsters and then the the cool part about the game is you have to gather resources to make potions and and antidotes and traps and all these sorts of other crazy things um bombs that type of stuff uh at the hub world or in in the during the hunt and uh these are vital to defeating some of the more difficult monsters and you can capture the monsters alive this is uh related to certain missions and and you can get better rewards that way and of course there's also a currency system in the game so it's a really cool game that um that their game franchise that is incredibly popular popular in japan and has just become uh very popular in in america i would say after monster in a world of course it was there were people playing Monster Hunter games before that, but Monster Hunter World did, it is one of Capcom's best-selling games, period. So I think it might be their best-selling game uh, because they br they finally broke into the American audience. So this game coming out on Switch, a very popular system right now, is super great for them um, in terms of sales. So I, I, I really wanted to pick it up... Um, because you know there hasn't been much on the switch as of late aside from bravely default 2 um and i think nintendo switch is just gearing up we'll talk about nintendo switch pro next uh but yeah so this new game is running on the re engine which uh resident evil 7 was built upon and it's it looks great for a Nintendo Switch game, I can't believe they they squeezed out this much um, this much power in in a handheld system. It looks very good. Um, you can tell there's some jagged edges here and there. It doesn't really get blurry, however. Uh, and I I played both on handheld and on on uh, docked mode, and I I think the graphics do hold up. The art style is is there. The characters look cool. Um, I guess you can see sort of in the character designs, their facial expressions and things. There's a little, you know, blur, not blurry, but less detailed uh, 
faces, but that doesn't really come into play because what you're really doing in this game is you're tracking these monsters. And some of the environments have a little muddy textures, I will say, because the uh, the grassland areas, you know, they don't look that great. But it's a Switch game, so you have to take that into account when you're playing it if you're coming off a of Monster Hunter World. It's not going to look as good as Monster Hunter World, but I'll tell you, it does look pretty good. In handheld mode, when this game is in action, it does look pretty close. I'll say that. Uh, so when you're in action, you're not really um, looking at the graphics too in depth, and and you're all in that fight. So the monsters, as you would come to expect, still have all that characteristic and and awesome gameplay and new like when you come across a new monster you don't really know what's going to happen uh so that sort of um excitement that you get when you play monster hunter is absolutely there for every single monster and all the designs are super cool so i really like that about monster hunter world uh it it just it doesn't really give you too much of a storyline i don't really care about the story for instance it, i mean there is a story I don't really need to get into it. You don't, you, you'll figure it out when you play it. But it's like they they just throw you into it, and it's pretty cool. They're like, here's a mission. Go kill this monster. And you're like, what? That I have to kill this monster? And then you go on the mission, and you find it, and you're like, wait, this is a crazy monster. And you go fight it. I don't know. It's, it's a lot of fun. Um, and then, obviously, things ramp up. You... You find you complete your first hunt. You're like, ah, oh, that was sick. And I don't know. It's it's just a it's it is a very fun gaming franchise. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the combat for newcomers. It's it can be a little frustrating because it is not a button mashy game. You have to time your attacks uh, well, and you have to, or you're going to be defeated by these monsters. You're gonna start taking damage. There's a stamina bar that decreases. I've noticed that the stamina bar decreases um, because you get hungry, for instance. The stamina bar does decrease uh, a lot faster than in Monster Hunter World. Uh, I've noticed that. But that's because I think they wanted to balance all the new things that they added to it, which are movement related. So they added wire bugs. So this game is really cool in that it it allows your character to become much more mobile. Uh, you can still dodge roll and things like that, but it allows your character to become much more mobile in terms of vertical movement. So you can jump up now and latch on to the monsters and essentially ride them and use the monsters to attack other monsters. Because uh, I think that's what they, they wanted. Monster Hunter always had monsters fighting each other while you were coming across them sometimes but now you can take control of the monsters with the wire bugs and fight the other monsters so i think that's a really cool idea uh excuse me as i have some tea it is the morning after all uh so i would have to say i definitely suggest you get this game if you have a nintendo switch um if you liked Monster Hunter World. If you're looking to get into Monster Hunter, it can be overwhelming. But I say stay stick with it if you like action role-playing games that are a little more complex. Um, there are a lot of systems to learn, and it doesn't do the best job of explaining all of them, but that would also take hours. So I think they really leave it up to the player to delve into the, these crazy deep systems and and i kind of respect that but i also it's like tekken right tekken has these really complex situations that you can be in and um and it, it the game does has zero tutorial so it sort of just leaves you up to the player leaves it up to the player to figure out oh did you know you can backdash cancel the Korean backdash? Did you know that that's going to change your gameplay? It's just simply learning this t one technique, right? So Monster Hunter World or in Monster Hunter Rise has a similar situation. Like, did you know you can craft this thing? Oh, did you know you can use it in this situation? Or if you 
you know, there, there's a whole combo system in the game as well. And you have to figure it out uh, through trial and error because all, because like a good fighting game uh, or like any fighting game, uh, all your actions have a fixed um, trajectory and a fixed startup frames and fixed uh, ending frames and do, a fi I, I mean, I don't think they do a fixed damage. I think it's related to sharpness of your weapon and uh, probably the level of your weapon. But um, so that type of thing is definitely coming from Capcom's history with fighting games. So I think that's really cool to see that. And um, it is the combat can feel clunky if you're not um, if you're coming from a game that that is a little more button mashy but it is it is well planned out and once you understand it and how it works the game is actually really cool so i highly suggest it obviously all the monster hunter heads out there already got it but if you're trying to pick this game up just know that there's actually a demo and i would suggest you play the demo first um, to get a better feel of the game in terms of how it actually feels to play um, but you know what this game could probably benefit from is actually a Nintendo Switch Pro. So we're going to move on and discuss to the Nintendo Switch Pro rumors that I have right here. Right here. Yes, so I have this IGN article up here by Matt TM Kim again. This guy is popping off on IGN. Go, Matt. Uh, you must be a freelancer and trying to... Maybe. I don't know who this guy is. He's certainly not one of the four... Uh, you know, the 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 people who are on the podcast. A lot of the... Maybe he is. I don't know. I don't listen to all their podcasts. But I... I the last podcast, we read two of his articles. So maybe uh, we'll read a second one. I also... Maybe I should put that in the end of the podcast. Yeah, we'll figure it out. Anyways, um, then since the Nintendo Switch came out, there have been rumors of a Nintendo Switch Pro model. Uh, but of recent uh, weeks and, and almost months now, uh, there's been new rumors coming up matt kim has round up has brought together all these industry experts uh who have their their eyes set on forecasting this nintendo switch pro essentially the story goes the rumors go is that nintendo is planning to make a nintendo switch pro model which will have an oled screen 720p um resolution however which i'm not necessarily the biggest fan of and it'll be i believe seven inches and i believe the switch is 6.2 inches if i'm not mistaken it'll essentially get rid of the bezels on the switch which is cool and um it will be able to output 4k resolution which i think is technically already within the if i'm not mistaken the it will be able to use the same uh dock so i think that's the goal i think the goal is to use the usb-c technology to output 4k resolution does that mean nintendo switch games will be coming out in 4k i don't think so so if we look, take a look at nintendo's history with iterative consoles we there's a really only one um example and i think it's the new 3ds i the new 3ds and new 3ds xl were released about halfway through the 3ds life cycle it was in order it was in order to place a nub which sort of acted you know like that the laptop nub that you would have in the middle of your keyboard it essentially functioned the same way, um, and it was to add that uh, as a um, right analog stick 
it was used in in very few games and they released one game that was exclusive to it uh xenoblade chronicles i think it was only one game they released xenoblade chronicles on switch uh which was a cool update to that game but of course uh, not on switch sorry in new 3ds but then they released it on switch is why i said that so which is obviously the definitive edition of that game because you can play it in hd so i would say that i think if they could figure out a way to scale these games up to 4k and output them in 4k that would be pretty cool but i don't think i don't i mean obviously it's possible when you buy a game on steam on your pc you can play it at 720p you can play whatever resolution you want um, does that mean that it's going to have better textures or anything better graphic textures like high mid low graphic settings i don't think so i think just having the capability of outputting in 4k is a pretty cool thing um this is essentially the rumor here but we can go dive into here uh, some more rumors i 4k support doesn't necessarily mean that the games will look good in 4k if they're still making all the games to be played on switch like you see it you see it yourself right if you if you play some of the games like for instance witcher 3 right this is my example. Witcher 3 is on Switch. I think it runs at like 540p on, or 5, I think it's 540 or 6, <laughs> whatever the step below 720 is on dock, in handheld docked mode, right? I got it. It's a fun game, obviously. It's Witcher 3. I wanted to play it. I like the idea of being able to take it on the go because I don't have time to play it at home. So I, I got pretty far in the game. I never beat it. I'm never going to beat that game. But it it functioned all right. It was like it dropped frames. It wasn't that hot uh, resolution wise. And you could you didn't really notice it too much. Obviously, if you're coming from PC, you're going to notice it. If you're coming from even PS4, you're going to notice it. But I, I, I still chugged along. Uh, you could see that there were texture pop-ins all the time, and a lot of the enemies lacked textures. Um, but the game functioned on handheld mode. But if you put it on dock mode, it would run at 720p, I believe, on the on the screen, on the big old screen. And then you noticed, oh, if you just increase the size of the picture you start noticing the textures look really bad. So it was just not the way I, obviously it's not the most I, optimal way to play Witcher 3. That would be on PC. But if that's the level of games that are going to be put out on Switch, um, because they're going, I, I assume the Switch Pro is just going to play Switch games. They're not going to be doing things like they did with the Nintendo new Nintendo Switch, or sorry, new nintendo 3ds um they're not going to be doing things like that uh where they release a game exclusively for it i think they're just going to try to release a game uh that plays on all the switch consoles which would be three at this point and um similar to how xbox is releasing games uh, i don't think that these games are going to be scaled in terms of graphic um graphical fidelity or or things like that just because nintendo put a new processor in there i think being able to output a 4k resolution is cool but it might not necessarily be bode so well for something like witcher 3 which was barely working on nintendo switch i'm not saying that witcher 3 is um the de facto example of of how games can look on Nintendo Switch. Obviously, it was it was downscaled so much 
uh, to fit on Nintendo Switch. But if you take a look at Breath of the Wild, or for instance, or Mario Odyssey, you have a game made specifically for Nintendo Switch that looks amazing um, because of the art style and because the the developers making those games uh, had so much time with the Switch and put a lot of care into making it uh, run perfectly on Switch. So th seeing that, seeing Mario Odyssey and Breath of the Wild on Switch in 4K would be really cool. I think those games would definitely hold up because they were designed properly for Switch. So moving forward, if we do see things like that, obviously Breath of the Wild 2 is coming out, Metro Prime 4, maybe some other Nintendo exclusive, uh, the new Pokemon game, Pokemon Ar Arceus, Arceus. Um, those games will benefit from running on Nintendo Switch Pro. I think that if they can put a processor out into this thing that will provide the Switch with a constant frame rate, that would be amazing. I don't think it's going to be running at 60 frames per second. Um, which would be oh my god if they could get these games running at 60 fps that would be amazing but if if they could just lock down 30 frames per second on switch and handheld mode that would be really great i i think that the game does struggle a lot with graphical stutter stutters even in new games like bravely default 2 i see uh frame rate stutters all the time and it's quite annoying especially when you're doing a function in the game that's built into the game, multiply the speed by four times uh, in the battle. Uh, that's especially when you see a lot of uh, graphical stutters in that game. Uh, it's not anything. It's a turn-based RPG. It doesn't actually matter. But it is, it is alarming to see the Switch moving forward at this rate. So I'd like to talk just pricing. I think the only way they're going to be able to sell this is probably at $300. I don't think anyone would want to buy a Switch above that price unless they're like me and I would buy a Switch Pro at, at 400. But if they if they are the same price as the PS5 and and the Xbox Series X, then it's it's not going to look good for them. So I think that the next thing that they also need to add is Bluetooth. Bluetooth would be a really fantastic feature for both um, docked mode and, uh, of course, handheld mode, which is what I really want it for. I think the handheld mode is in dire need of Bluetooth. I mean, if you just even look back to the PlayStation Vita, something that came out in 2011, I believe, 10 years ago, it had Bluetooth in it. It had an OLED screen. So that's that's the type of foresight that Sony had when making the Vita that Nintendo just refuses to put into their system. So hopefully we do get an OLED screen because that would make uh, colors much more vibrant. Hopefully we do get a new processor that can output 4K and also lock down a solid frame rate for these games. And hopefully we get Bluetooth and these types of things and maybe and hopefully we also get a larger screen i could see all those things benefiting nintendo switch um, and hopefully we get a 300 350 price point i i think that would be the that would be a game changer for switch and it would exclude uh, extend the life cycle of the nintendo switch probably another three or four years on top of whatever it's going to be so that's my uh two cents on the nintendo switch uh, pro, I hope things work out for them. Speaking of of uh, Nintendo Switch Pro, you might be wondering how the heck they're going to make it when there's a worldwide shortage of semiconductors. So, there's a couple reasons obviously okay here's here's the lowdown 
Semiconductors are made from silicon. Whoa! Speaking of Nintendo Switch Pro, you might be wondering how they're going to be making that when there's a shortage of semiconductors in multiple and across multiple industries such as cars smartphones now cars which is crazy uh, but smartphone companies and uh, of course amd and nvidia are the two big ones who make graphics cards and and uh, intel makes cpus and amd makes cpus so in order to make graphics cards you need silicon um, that's typically what's and silicon dioxide uh, that's typically what they're made out of nowadays of course you might have find whatever your super high-end stuff which has a different uh, semiconductor in there um, but those are all proprietary at this point if you're buying any consumer grade um, CPU or GPU it's gonna be on silicon and that's because it's fucking cheap um, or it's cheap enough to be m and Essentially, the way it's made and the abundance of the material combine to a price point in which make, uh, making it on silicon, making a semiconductor on silicon, even though it might not be the most efficient material to make a semiconductor on, is the cheapest route. So because we're able to manufacture single crystal silicon uh, silicon wafers uh, very efficiently at this point and also able to use photolithography to make them um, that's why we use silicon um, and various other materials on on top of the silicon uh, such as gold and and to make such transistors and things like that and, and other semiconductors on top of the silicon um, that's why we're able to make it using silicon so taking a look further into this um, I have an article up from Forbes saying there's a worldwide shortage of semiconductors hurting car and smartphone companies here's how investors can benefit well that's that's one way of looking at it I also wanted to look into why there's a shortage essentially it all comes down to business. It's not that there's actually a shortage of silicon. It comes down to supply and demand. Um, it's not like we're running out of silicon in the world. So I, I wouldn't look at it at that look at it in that uh, perspective. So the way these things get made is these companies need to think forecast their entire year of production a year ahead um, or at the beginning of the year some at some point in the year they need to forecast uh, and put into production a certain amount of chips a certain amount of semiconductors um, and honestly I mean that's what they have to do it's it is the the business that they are in uh, so they need to forecast it in order to do that, they need to look at industry trends. They see, oh, there's a pandemic going on in 2020. This was last year, obviously. Uh, there's a pandemic going on. We need to forecast that people probably aren't going to be investing in semiconductors and things like that. Why would, why would anyone buy a $500 GPU right now? They have coronavirus or something like we need to deal with that so they basically forecast fewer gpus and cpus um and in that would be put into smart tvs computers high-end computers cars everything everything that is has a computer in it um obviously uh cpu gpu so because they forecast it improperly or they were not improperly they just couldn't predict that people sitting at home or who are now sitting at home getting a stimulus check potentially also 
getting paid the whole time, still want to buy their CPUs and GPUs. Oh, you know what I always wanted to get into? Making PCs. Make my own PC. So now people are buying them again. And because they had to forecast their entire, um, their entire line of production, they, they can only make a certain amount. So that's where the shortage comes in. It's not because we're running low on silicon. Um, it's because they were unable to predict the market in which these needed to be made, uh, in, in which the supply and demand is not a, uh, at equilibrium. So that would be why there's a shortage. Um, they also, the car companies, which is a funny one, um, of course, they had to do a similar thing. They take a look at, oh, people are probably not going to be going into work. Um, that sucks. So people are probably not going to be buying new cars. So we have to reduce our production because we're going to eat in the, the end if we make too many cars this year um, or too many CPUs for cars, for instance. So the problem with that is that once people started going back to work, they realize oh i don't want to take the bus i don't want to take um public transit that's disgusting i need to get myself a car now so that's where that shortage is coming in as well that's why you see this in the business um so that's hilarious and that sucks uh so it, it does boil down to these companies not being able to uh, in a way of course there it's multiple uh, different it's a multifaceted problem obviously it's not as simple as saying that but in that is certainly one that is certainly one way in which this shortage arose it's because uh, the, the companies were unable to predict the unpredictability of the uh, pandemic that we're in and it's really hurting their bottom line and I mean, in reality, this is such a first world problem. <laughs> but it sucks for people who need to get new GPUs and CPUs, right? It's it's a industry that that uh, is certainly in trouble right now. But I think that uh, they're going to, I don't know, because they already had to predict this year, which this is probably the most unpredictable year, surely, because we've already gone through last year. We already went through the thick of it, but it's impossible to predict how we're going to get out of this problem. So this shortage is probably going to go on, I predict. For another year until 2022 so if you're looking for a gpu um, if you're looking for a cpu if you're looking for a new car if you're looking for a new smartphone best of luck to you i don't know if that's the move right now or even a smart tv or a laptop right but i would say and again i'm not a financial advisor i would say that these companies they're probably going to take a dip in their stocks uh, but i don't think that's a problem this is an industry that's going to come back no problem because uh as we move further and further towards uh an electronic age um a computer controlled age these companies are going to take off they're going to be this industry is going to be like crazy in the next couple of years i would say by 2025 you invest now probably a smart idea 2025 you're going to be back on top baby that's my financial advice for the day <laughs> and then uh finally we have another story that is also related to this look at that i picked four topics that are all related in a way the old suez canal <laughs> I can't believe it. I, I also wanted to, I think this 
topic i wanted to do a, a small segment where we go on twitter and we see what people are talking about it so we'll do that at the end um so <laughs> as the story goes this is from uh i think it's abc cnbc we're on nbc sorry <laughs> by paul a einstein really i uh, eisenstein I can't read today. Sorry. Anyways, there's a blockage on the Suez Canal because a cargo ship turned 90 degrees. I don't know how. Let's read into this. So here I have <laughs> some pictures of this uh, evergreen cargo ship that got stuck. <laughs> this is hilarious. Oh my god. For those who don't know, the Suez Canal is a man-made canal that, you know, essentially they found that obviously there are various... When, when um, we started moving things, large quantities of things uh, across the world on, on by land, or, uh, sorry, by sea, we found that it would be so, it would be so great if we could just connect the old Red Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. Um, and so it, it goes through Egypt um, and it's essentially right here. So it, it essentially connects, allows people to move things um, from Africa or, or whatever, or Asia, um, and not have to go around the entire continent. So it, it cuts cuts it down by literally like essentially six months. <laughs> so in terms of shipments. So that's pretty awesome. Uh, Man-made canal obviously probably did some horrible things to the environment and, and surrounding people. Who knows? I, I don't want to get into the politics of the Suez Canal. But um, it has also vastly increased the uh, time in which production can or decrease the time in which production can be done for various industries so a lot of things get transported through this canal uh, across the world and it's highly valuable so this was actually a pretty cool uh, if you watch the video uh, i have a article from usa today showing a little uh little boat trip up the Suez Canal and when you come to here on March 23rd you get this boat er, big mistake buddy <laughs> so basically holding up this um, this huge traffic jam on the Suez Canal like I said probably around six months added to your time uh, but it doesn't make sense to go through that um, this is such a large cargo ship that that uh, they're unable to move it essentially, which is why this is still a developing story. So just, I guess this is a, a quote the, from the vice president of research for the Center of Automotive Research in Ann Arbor, Michigan. It only takes a shortage of one part to mess things up. That's I, I assure you that is true. So it's so cargo ships the way they work is they, they obviously they transfer a lot of shit. When you're making something like an automotive thing, you don't get all your parts from one place. They could be coming from multiple places. They, you could buy one part in America. You could buy one part in China that comes from China. So getting that one part from China, let's say, I don't know. Let's say you get your CPUs made. Who knows? There's that shortage going on now, right? We just discussed that. Uh, but let's say you're, the automotive industry is now in deep shit because not only can they not get their CPUs to keep up with demand, they also can't get their, um, their, I don't know, their steel. Let's say that's what they're trying to transport or their, their, um, 
glass windows or or maybe it's like one small rubber part that is still vital to the safety of the car and they can't get that right now because of this holdup so the the automotive industry is definitely going to tank because of two a multifaceted problem again because of the Suez Canal problem uh, which is both hilarious but also very detrimental to this industry um, and also because of the CPU and GPU silicon semiconductor shortage so that's crazy man I can't believe this happened um, but I'm all for it man let's let's fuck shit up you know I, I want to see oh my god this is some detail photos that's cool so this is this boat is really um is short essentially it is stuck in some dirt i didn't know it was that bad but that's even worse <laughs> so yeah that's the suez canal problem we'll see if there's any more developments in the future but it is it is essentially affecting bmw mercedes-benz god forbid people can't buy their mercedes-benz but of course those companies also make parts for other people i think uh or at least they get their i don't know it's it's a volkswagen volvo you know dealerships that's crazy man As a little added segment, I did want to go see what's going on on Twitter, what people are saying on Twitter. So let's go look that up. We're going to search Suez Canal on Twitter and see what people are saying. <laughs> this person says, I finally freed up the Suez Canal. You're welcome. He goes in the Photoshop. <laughs> rotates the <laughs> he rotates the boat and then moves it along moves it 90 degrees oh my god shakti shetty says everything reminds me of the suez canal and he's got a crep uh in between <laughs> in between uh some nice looking sauces that is very funny and then cigar says only hanumanji manji can solve the suez problem and he's got i guess hanumanji i'm not very familiar with this deity but he's carrying the evergreen uh cargo ship Chris Bolton <laughs> has a really great photo. You think it's bad in the Suez Canal? Question mark. And he's got this little baby boat in this tiny. <laughs> That's a great photo. Um, okay. I want to see memes, guys. Suez Canal memes. Now this is funny. <laughs> At UAE underscore YOT 2019. And of course, memes can't be missing. Hashtag Suez Canal. He's got this. Is that the. Is that's from Austin Powers. So <laughs> there's a scene in Austin Powers where he's essentially in the same situation with a. I think it's a forklift. Oh, it's. It's a. Uh, it's not exactly a forklift, but he's stuck in a, a narrow hallway and he's put this uh, the cargo ship on top of superimposed on top of it. It's great. <laughs> oh, my God. 2021 world economic collapse ship drawing a dig at 
Suez Canal. This is great. The meme game is strong with the boat stuck in the Suez Canal. You may make mistakes, but at least they're usually not. We can see your mistake from space bad. <laughs> I think that's a, says Chloe Chalier. LOF, L of the internet. At L of the internet. That's a funny. <laughs> oh my God. And then <laughs> Matt Whitlock says, I think this is definitely, this is probably a good one. <laughs> He's got a, a photo of the, what we just looked at. The, uh, the goddamn little baby, <laughs> the baby backhoe <laughs> trying to dig up the, the dirt and he's labeled it me and then the boat is his my problems oh my god he's just barely chipping away at his problems yeah that's about it i wanted to say that this is both a hilarious problem i'm glad everyone could make light of it um it's a pretty funny thing to come out of this year huh and we're not even we're not even halfway through the year, people. It's going to be fun. I also wanted to say one quick last thing at the end of the podcast. Um, I am really sad about the passing of Jessica Walter. Um, she was 80 years old. She was part of two of my favorite shows. Um, one, Arrested Development, was absolutely spectacular. The, that show um even through the most recent seasons just a truly a cherished show to me i love that show um partially because of jessica walter she was a really amazing actor and uh my heart goes out to uh all the people affected especially her family it's a really sad day i i mean she played uh obviously lucille bluth uh in arrested development and she also played uh mallory i believe in archer which is essentially the same character in both but uh they're just she's just so funny and it's a really sad day when we lose a great comedic mind like that and and of course uh, an excellent actor as well um so my heart goes out to her I, I just wish uh, wish them all the best, you know? It's, Arrested Development, I had to say. I, I think of on I need to do a review of the show. I think it might be timely now. But uh, it's, it's one of the shows in which it's got all these amazing characters. And as you progress through the show, you just like, oh, <laughs> George Michael's my favorite character. No, it's... it's uh, Lucille Bluth. No, it's Buster. It's like each character has such a cool story arc, and they're all really fantastic, well written characters, and of course, amazingly acted. It's just uh, one of the best shows around. I highly suggest you watch it. Um, and of course, uh, rest in peace, Jessica uh, Walter. And with that, I'm going to end the podcast. Thank you so much for listening to another solo pod we made it an hour almost holy crap i talk too much anyways i i want to do these uh meme ish reviews on twitter uh because obviously we don't have a meme review segment like pewdiepie but we don't have a uh subreddit where you can post memes too so i have to go find the memes but I'm fine with that. I would love to review the the memes of the day related to the topic of the show at the end of the topic of each topic. So as we move on, maybe I'll be able to plan it out more. Um, but that's going to be the format of the podcast until Avon comes back. So I hope you guys enjoyed the podcast. Thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you guys next week. Have a good one. Bye.